I'd watch the practice with none of my friends. I'd turn the dial to ABC to see the creep of the week that Bobby Donald defends. But I'm out of practice. With your host, Keith Barney. Out of practice. And Michael Indeglio. Way back in high school, most every night, my mom watched QVC, so I missed the practice. There was no TiVo, what could I do? Wait 15 years, get fat, then stream it on Hulu. I'm in a fat guy shame spiral, but at least I wasn't bullied by a six-year-old. Catch up with your friend for the first time in a year, and he uses everything you said against you. Everything. Oh, please, that is a deep well, sir. <laughs> and welcome to the Out of Practice Podcast. It is a weekly podcast in which Mike and I discuss David e. Kelly's award-winning series, The Practice. This week, we are up to Season 6, Episode 9, Inter Arma Silent Leisures. We've got some... Uh, Got some important legalese, some Latin, perhaps, this week. Uh, so how's it going? I know how it's going because you were at my house literally yesterday. Yeah, what a what a fun trip. I was, uh, you know, for two people who are who are pretty generally socially awkward, we had was, uh, a great time. It was wonderful. I had was, a wonderful, I had such a great weekend. What a great weekend I had. I did. Well, it's not over yet. Uh, that's yeah. That's true. Well, and I went you, out to. I, yeah, oh, go ahead. Wow. It feels like we haven't podcasted in forever. We're already it's like we haven't talked. Ta- have ta- um, uh, nine days. I uh, I got to go see Jen out in Connecticut, uh, in into the woods, which was just so much fun for a variety of reasons, which I will share. It was my first time in a theater to see li- a live performance. It was. Uh, so that was moving. It was the first time seeing Jen perform since I saw her in Fiddler on the Roof over a year ago. Right. And, you know, I don't want to, I've talked, we talked ad nauseum about Into the Woods, the Yiddish production, and it was wonderful. And it it is was such an accomplishment for her in a variety of different ways for her career, for just to just to learn a language that's, that it's still in, incomprehensible to me that some, you could learn a show in a different, in that kind of a difficult language. Um, it, but the thing is, is that, you know, it, it's not a very singy role. And she they, has they, this glorious voice. Right. That she got to use, but, you know, n- not really stretch. And they had her behind a, a, a wake, a makeup wall, really, for that part. And right. So she was wonderful as a character in that show, and, and I appreciate it. However, Into the Woods is um, is one of my favorite Sondheim masterpieces, and the Cinderella role gets to sing some yeah. just musical theater canon staples. And the production was beautiful. It was moving. She was beautiful and wonderful, and it was so it was so inspiring to see her do what she does. And, and I, I'm so excited to roll the clip you t- recorded. Guys, I, <laughs> I bought a new field recorder to like bootleg this, to get a bootleg recording. And I had it set up. Uh, my friend who was going to come with me couldn't come. So I had a spare seat. I like, I, and as I'm maneuvering, I thought that I had busted the, the SD card. But what happened is as I was maneuvering to get the perfect positioning of the microphone. And then I decided to just, because it auto starts a new file every gigabyte. I was like, perfect, I can just set it and forget it. And guess what? I set it and forget it, but I apparently never hit record. So, or I hit a button that, that something happened. What I what I captured was 24 seconds of bird sounds, <laughs> of <laughs> bird atmosphere that they had playing pre-show. And mm-hmm. uh, long story short, it, it's gonna live in the ephemeral recesses mm-hmm. of my memory. But it was wonderful. It was really great. And then on the drive home the following day, I I stopped by and saw my buddy Keith's new house, which was wonderful. Uh, And I got to hang out with Keith and his wife, which uh, 
I didn't, I haven't seen, really got to chat with with Jillian in, in in very long in a long time. So yeah, it was great. We just we we had plans, but we ended up sitting on the back deck having a beer. I, I apologies to uh, founding sponsor Phoenix Cage, to oh uh, yeah, to Big whom problem. I had uh, promised a, a great practical joke on Keith and and ruined it. Uh, but th- those are details for another time. And but anyhow. Uh, it was a great weekend. And then today is, sorry, Keith, I'm, I'm rambling. Today is the 20th anniversary of of the passing. We're recording on the 20th anniversary of my dad passing away. Uh, he's up above Keith there, and uh, you know, it's mixed feelings. I like to celebrate and, and just give a moment, give a nod. Uh, but also, it's 20 years. I'm 40 years old, so it is now officially half well. of my life. And I don't. I have. I haven't really. Uh, it's hard to really kind of unpack what I'm feeling. It's it's weird. Generally, it goes by, and it's more of a, like a, a, a whatever. But anyway, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, let's all raise a glass of coffee, whatever you got going, uh, to, to, to Joe up there doing what he do, or just thanks for uh, helping make me the broken, shattered human being that I am. <laughs> <laughs> but as we talk often on the pod about synchronicity, when we mm-hmm. get to this day in the basement, I have a, a fun little something I found. That's all. Cool. What about you, Keith? How are you doing? Yeah, no, I mean, no, here's here's to uh, Mr. Indegleo. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's it's rare that our chit-chat just basically is like, yeah, what mic's that? Because, uh, yeah. you know, fi- finally got to, you were the second person, uh, first one not blood-related to be at the house. And, of course, we're recording this on May 16th, so we were the, the first episode after the new CDC guidelines about fully vaccinated folks um, not having to mask in a lot of situations. So certainly the first time I've seen a person unmasked indoors in my own home. Um, yes. So that that was, you know, we're, we've both been vaccinated for a while now. Um, if you haven't, Get it. What yep. are you doing? Get your vaccination. Especially new information God's about sakes. this Indian variant uh, that apparently is a, a, a wildfire spreader. So For just do it. all of it. All of it. Let Get me it tell done. You, if you haven't done it yet, let me just tell you, uh, at, you by now know how awkward Keith and I have, I have mentioned it, but even hugging Keith was the first hug that I have given out in over a year. So To a nod, to, yeah, to somebody other than your wife. Yeah. Well, you know. That you're assuming me and my wife hug. We just like That's fair full enough. bang every time we see each other. We well, we look. Hug. <laughs> <laughs> wow, just straight to hide in the willy. Okay. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> Into the wood indeed. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh so can't wait go, to get folks. your text about this episode. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> got it. Uh, anyway, oh, I got to meet uh, Charlie. Most importantly, I got to meet you. Got Charlie, to meet Charlie, who the, was just as cool as you, you as he's shown on camera. He's so cool, and uh, I feel like this is a good opportunity to hop into. We have tried for years to make this podcast a success. We, we failed. failed. It's time to give the world what it wants. Meow, meow. How perfectly I started playing the jingle. He's now looking straight at me from outside his room. Oh, he He's heard it. His, he knows. He knows. He knows we're about to talk about him. So, yeah. So lots have happened in in uh, Charlie World this week. Um, first off, we have uh, not necessarily a cat, but we have a yard otter. We uh, we have a, a, a groundhog, which has now been hanging out in our yard, which has been uh, really fun. They're super cute. And he's just there munching on the clover. And uh, so he's he's got a little path that he goes through the yard. And he's uh, it's been there every day for the last three days, at least for a little bit. So super cute. Some would say that has very little to do with your cat. But it's sort of cat-sized, you know. Oh, it, fair. It's, fair. It's cute. It's cat-sized. It's in okay. our yard. So the other thing that happened, well, I have three things that happened. The second one is also not quite cat-related. Uh but I had to bury a dead, uh, uh, the, what's the thing with the white face and the, and the long tail? 
a weasel? No, the uh, the creepy looking ones that are really good for you to eat ticks. A vole? You kept saying no. the word vole yesterday, so well, I well, that's assumed. that's story number three. Oh shit! Spoiler. Well, whatever. There was a dead animal that I had to bury on in my own lawn yesterday, which is all of this makes it sound like I live out in the woods. And and nope. I clearly do not. It's like a little 50 foot by 50 foot yard, but a lot happens in that yard. So story number three is uh, up in Charlie's room here. He's He has one of those like window well covers. It's plastic. It's all screwed down into the, the window well itself so he can't get out. But on the edges, it there's a little lip that he's able to like stick his paw out and growl and grab leaves and stuff. And uh, a couple days ago, sitting here at the desk, and all of a sudden I hear something, wait, 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 wait. And he had caught a vole. Just through that little sliver? Through that little sliver. He just reached in and sort of and tagged it. But it had escaped, but had crawled deeper into the seam of the of the window well. So the plastic comes together at a point and so he'd gotten himself entirely trapped in there charlie couldn't get him but he couldn't get out so i had to spend the morning i pulled charlie out of his room closed the window that took a screwdriver and pulled off the window well to save this poor vole who had gotten himself stuck in there meanwhile the vole's pissed charlie's even more pissed that he doesn't get to eat the the creature that he that somehow wandered into the three square inches he could get his paws outdoors. I don't yeah, know. You want to talk about thing, unlucky. But... That is an unlucky little thing. That Well, it's lucky he survived two oh, different things away. that would have yeah. killed him. But it, he wasn't the brightest vole in the shed uh, getting himself into that, uh, into that little spot there. So lots happening in the cat world, in the animal world. Uh, he was certainly happy to meet you. Uh, He's he's such a chill little guy. Yeah, he's he, cool. Like strangers, he's like, "Hello, I love you too," which is yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's like he's a little rad. dog cat. Yeah, I, I was a big fan of of Charlie. My cats were interested in his smell when I came. I home. bet they were. Yep, I I bet they were. Uh, okay, should we move forward? Do we have any CCDD content? Uh, no, nothing worth. Uh, I, we'll, we'll get there, but it's nothing nothing worth talking about this week. Okay, well then let's move forward to. Filings and subpoenas. Filings oh. and subpoenas. Filings and subpoenas. Filings and subpoenas. Well, if you uh, would like to file or subpoena, uh, you can do <laughs> us a big favor and reach out to us at Out of Practice Podcast at gmail.com. We're on Facebook and Instagram at Out of Practice Podcast. We'll be psyched to hear from you. And uh, who do we hear from? Well, of course, our moderator, Phoenix Cage who uh, says a lot here, so I'm going to try to compress a little bit. <laughs> but uh, re- it, some interesting stuff. He, he actually did some like legitimate research for us, which we always oh, appreciate. Yes. So uh, Phoenix says, I'm really glad you guys are no longer recording in, in advance. Uh, you knew we were not going to be organized <laughs> enough to have a, an episode in the can ahead of time for very what, long. How long did it last? Uh, says it gets Less harder than a month. when you Less can't even month. remember what episode was two weeks ago. And then his comment comes in four weeks later. Yeah, I get it. Uh, however, he says, actually, Keith, you were 100% right about the plot of Honor Code. And then you let Mike convince you that you were confusing it with Suffer the Little Children. Wait, did I just say Keith was right? No, no, that couldn't have been me. It must have been Phoenix Cage. Uh, he, <laughs> he clearly got... He found the uh, Easter egg. He uh, The little Easter egg that we built just for you, Phoenix. <laughs> In the uh, on the jury, uh, hilarious. He said, uh, "I actually had a lot of feelings about Honor Code. The client's doctor discovered a ticking time bomb in the kid's head, but they decided to never tell the parents it was there. Jimmy had a crisis of conscience and blew the whistle. Then Eugene got him disbarred for doing so. Thank you for the recap. That saves me a lot of trouble. But how can the ethical thing be to sit on that secret?" Agreed. Is it ethically any different than when a lawyer knows the location of a kidnap victim who was in danger, but revealing the fact would be bad for his client? Based on David E. Kelly's portrayal of the law, it seems so. The lawyers in these two situations would have polar opposite responsibilities. However, after researching the subject, I believe David E. Kelly was wrong. This is from the American Bar Association on the subject of confidentiality. Quote, although the public interest is usually best served by a strict rule requiring lawyers to preserve the confidentiality of information relating to the representation of their clients, the confidentiality rule is subject to limited exceptions. 
Paragraph one recognizes the overriding value of life and physical integrity and permits disclosure reasonably necessary to prevent reasonably certain death or substantial bodily harm. Such harm is reasonably certain to occur if it would su- if it would be suffered imminently or there was a present and substantial threat that the person will suffer harm on that later date if the lawyer fails to take action necessary to eliminate the threat. Thus, a lawyer who knows that a client has accidentally discharged toxic waste into the town's water supply may reveal this information to authorities if there is a present and substantial risk that a person who drinks the water will contract a life-threatening or debilitating disease, and the lawyer's disclosure is necessary to eliminate the threat or reduce the number of victims. Close quote. I think that's pretty cut and dry. Sounds it. And 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 you got to imagine that there is a team on the writing staff that researches these things legally. They at least have a, what do you call it, a uh, a, a consultant. Yeah. And at times, I think you have to make the decision, My get, I mean, of course, that we're going to take artistic license here and no. just to, to make our, you know, to, to make our story palpable or tolerable. And, and I believe, and I, I, I may be completely wrong here, that would be a first. Uh, but I think David E. Kelly actually studied law for a while. Uh, so interesting. Uh, thanks, Things Phoenix. That's actually really good information. That's, uh, that's super useful. Thanks, Phoenix. Uh, all right. Well, while you're reaching out to us, while you're sending us an email, while you're writing on Facebook and Instagram, you can also do us another giant favor. Join the four Phoenix cages on the jury. And leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other service of your choice. We will welcome you into the jury. We will read what you write, good, bad, or ugly. You can give us one star and and tell us we're crap. You're still on the jury. You know, it's America. You get to uh, convict or acquit us. So uh, do us a huge favor. It makes a big difference. You know, we we have a very small but passionate community here. I would love to have a medium but passionate community so uh do us a huge favor and leave the rating and Keith, review. the analytics tell me that almost 60 percent of our active listening base is mm-hmm. about six months behind <laughs> you know you've been saying that from since the first episode i know <laughs> and we never catch up they never well i mean it's i it, it's impossible to catch up but we still love you, people who are listening in 2023. Uh, That's right. We it's, wish you could have been a part of the conversation, but I feel like you know you've got some. We've got some go getters in the jury. In, we in, sure do. That are that are. Well, it's it, it's our own fault for putting it out and putting out an unstoppable torrent of content, whether mm-hmm. anybody asks for it or not. And in fact, I I looked it up uh, just this afternoon before we were uh, killing time before. We signed on. We have done how, how many? How many hours do you think we have done? We have to be approaching two hundred hours. We are. We have done two hundred and twenty-seven hours of uh, out of practice content, which, if you're counting at home, is uh, a little over nine days. Jesus. <laughs> you know what? The, here's the thing. I really would like people to do because mm. I know there are at least dozens of listeners. <laughs> on, a, on a weekly basis. So if nothing else, even if you don't want to watch our fat faces on the YouTube, go to the YouTube oh. and talk with and, and and interact with moderator Phoenix Cage. We can't keep up with him. He is, he dissects things. He, he, he analyzes things. He is more interesting and more well-researched than us. So if you are interested in the actual plot lines and the intricacies of what's happening episode to episode, Go to the YouTubes and talk with him because it's, it's otherwise worth- he's going to start his own superior podcast and then yeah, we'll be wiped off the face of the planet. What are we going to do with ourselves, guys? If you care anything about our mental well being, help us out here. All right. <laughs> Jesus. At this point, if they cared about our mental well being, they'd stop listening just from the sheer sadness of it. Yeah, Speaking that, of know. sadness, you talked about fat faces. So, uh, to explain my Easter egg right now behind me in the video here you can see a uh, david pasternak jersey the boston my my beloved beloved boston bruins have just started the playoffs and sadly we lost in overtime to washington last night which made me sad but you might notice if you're watching on youtube the three people who do uh that i i shaved i cut off most of my facial hair oh and then i froze fun 
Uh, oh, no, but I good. cut off most oh, of my facial freeze. hair. You did freeze, Keith. I did. I'll come back. There I am. Uh, oh, there he is. Because in hockey, I think I mentioned it last year, but it's traditional to grow a playoff beard. So you have you stop shaving until you get eliminated. That's all the players do, and that's what most of the fans do as well. But I already had a pretty decent beard when we started, so I figured let me just start fresh, and then we'll see how it goes. So if the Bruins, uh, you know, have a long series, we might get pretty bushy uh, by the end of this. So stay tuned. There it is. However, uh, the reason I wear a beard in the first place is to cover up my fatty jowls. And now, uh, when I'm clean shaven, I just get very, very sad when I look in the mirror. And so there it is, folks. Ugh, need to get back to low cow Keith. All right. Well, that's, that's enough of me. We're going to charging Keith by the hour, I think. That's enough of me shaming myself on the internet. <laughs> Let us move forward. Let us hop back into the time machine all the way back 20 years to December 9th the year 2001, and answer the eternal question that nobody asks, what was going on? This day in the basement. Uh, yeah, so we talked about synchronicity, which, are we, that is a word, right? No, it's it's profoundly not a word. Well, it should be, because that's <laughs> damn good. Well, well it is pointed. now. I mean, yeah. I was reading some sort of, there was like a, oh no, there's a joke on Modern Family that uh, vocabulary, whether or not it's a word, is basically about confidence. Yeah, so if you right. just look into the camera and use it directly, eh, it's a word. So I, I mentioned my pop 20 years, and I had just moved to New York, not but a few months after he passed away. Yeah, well, it was uh, May, June, July, August, September, October. Yeah, about half a, half, half a year. And, you know, as we, we talked about a little bit a few weeks ago, the 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 educators in the theater love to break you down. They really think they got to emotionally break you down yeah. to get to the to get to the meat of the matter. And so the first piece I really worked on to present was this piece uh, written by, if I'm not mistaken, Craig Carnelia for working no. the show working called Fathers and Sons. And it's basically oh, did Craig write that? I believe so, if I'm not mistaken. That I could be sense. wrong. Uh, maybe makes, Google it. Speaking of an acting teacher who likes to break you down. Yeah. Did you ever work with him? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I didn't mention that I sang that song. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> you never want to sing somebody's song for them, generally, as a rule of thumb. Uh, it's awkward. Any, yeah. But anyway, you know, I was way too young to, to learn this song, to perform this song, uh, because it's about a, a person that are, like, I guess, I would guess, mid-30s to maybe 50s, uh, singing about their dad in reference to their child and recognizing the circle of life and parenthood and which really hit home when I was watching into the woods, but that's, that's an aside. And, you know, it was an interesting experience because of course, at the time I really, it was really about trying to put myself in my father's shoes uh, to, in order to sort of look my grief in the, in the face which was kind of brilliant by my acting teacher, if not very painful, because what is acting but kind of mining your personal experiences to create something you haven't experienced, mostly. Anyway, uh, I don't know that I did it justice at the time. I think that I will do working at some point in my life and I will have great context. But regardless, uh, I... This, uh, this period of time, December-ish, towards the middle of December, right before Christmas, was our first uh, jury type of situation. Mm. Not It wasn't so much like a bunch of people, but it was for the presentation for the class, like for a, a grade or however the hell that worked. I don't even remember how grading worked when it came to conservatory. Because how do you... How, how, how does one grade art? Yeah. But anyhow, this was my first kind of presentation of it. So it's it's interesting that... Today is the day we get to look mm. back at that presentation of this song. It's all kind of comes together. So I don't, there's no video recording of nah, those hoping. presentations. However, you could sign up for what we call tapings. There was this little like studio room and there'd be uh, David Caldwell on piano who would just sit there and for hours you could sign up and you could have 15 minutes to go in and just like run shit. So um, I found... Uh, <gasps> 
an MP3 of a really bad run of this tune. But yes, uh, um, it sounds all right. So I found a clip of it just to kind of like recall uh, 21-year-old Mike dealing with working through some of the passages. Now, the cool yeah. thing about this is, well, it's not really like a huge sing, but it was more like me trying to be an act. It's, it's not what it's about, but I did find something here. I'll play it. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm still excited. He was my hero then. He couldn't do no wrong as far as I was concerned. I thought he was the wisest and the strongest and the best of men. The tables hadn't turned. I had learned how little time it takes. And everybody breaks. And daddies make mistakes. So there you go. There's a clip of it. That's fantastic. What a great so, uh, thing to have. Yeah. Well, I have a ton of those, but they're on these little mini discs or mini uh, mini cassettes. Oh, I have yeah. My old recorder, no, sure. So, uh, like, then we all. So, I mean, you sounded great. That's a great, it's a great song for you. We should, we should do a cover of it at some point. I'll play it for you. You can sing it. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. it's interesting. Speaking of synchronicity, um, a good friend of mine uh, is artistic director of a theater out up, upstate, and they're doing working this summer. And I'm wondering if I can't maybe uh, maybe it's a time to go. That. Maybe it's time to go do it. Yeah, yeah, you definitely should. No, no, I have a I have a <laughs> my uh, my 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 autistic brain uh, question for him. The piano that he played that on was it purple? I, I don't I don't think so. It sounds like a, it sounds like a Kurzweil. Which is uh, it's a type of electronic keyboard because I had the exact same. Yeah, there, there so, was two. Sounds exactly like the sample that I used at exactly that same time. Yeah, it, there was definitely two studios. One was just like a, 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 a upright, and then there was one that was like you, you could you could get your taping with like a little bit of reverb because you had the. Yeah, I mean this is definitely must have been a, the electric a digital. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. There's definitely some cool. flubs that come up towards after I cut. So I'm glad that it's a that's a. As we mean, you have become uh, akin or uh, accustomed to is finding the right little clip. <laughs> well, and you know, Lord knows we have never flubbed on this, so our audience thinks we are incapable of flubbing anything. Well, let me tell you what we weren't thinking about twenty years ago, as it, mm. those twenty-year-old Mike and Keith never thought that any of these recordings would see the light of the internet, <laughs> or really understood what the internet was at the time. So, oh, I knew what the internet was, but it not, took not this forty-five minutes to download that clip. That was the problem. <laughs> Right. And we sure as heck weren't uh, live recording a, uh, a multi-cam video show in 4K. Yeah, that's true. 4K didn't exist. All right. Uh, yeah, so uh, interesting. I have Speaking a sort of, of a heartbreak. <laughs> oh, because you've got the damn rundown. See, that's not fair. I can't give you the rundown. You got a, uh, you got a heads up on what I'm going to talk about. Well, generally, I just look for what song was playing at the time. But I happened to see, because you put a, like a funny <laughs> note on your this thing in the basement. So I saw it. I clocked it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so uh, going back into the email archive, I found an email that I sent this week uh, to my mother, giving her the Mommy! heads. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, who's probably listening to this? Hi, mom. Hi, mom. Hope how's your walk going? Hope it's uh, hope the hike is going. Oh, she well. listens on the walk. She does. She listens as she hikes up and down the uh, the mountain. She could probably under. walk seventeen miles in one episode of this show. <laughs> and she kind of does. I mean, she. She just races up the mountain like a mountain goat up and down twice every day. Anyway. Uh, it's called your mother so, a mountain goat. In a good way. She'll, in she'll a good it. way. Quote, unquote, in a good way. Well, I mean, I I'd would say be... that you're more like a puma. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's... Now, now, that goes uncomfortable in another way. Yeah, but she's not my mom, so it's cool. No, no, but like it's <laughs> like the puma is the older version of the cougar, you realize. Is it? It is. Oh uh, well, you know what? Your mom's your mom's out to trot. Why not? There you go. Uh, I think you I think you've got a shot, mom. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go ahead and move forward. She just threw her phone into the woods. <laughs> <laughs> when do you think the show jumped the shark? I think when Mike started hitting on Keith's mom in real time. <laughs> 
Yeah, because she was the was... only person who listened. <laughs> Basically, we're we're so excited to have any listener that Mike will hit on you. If you yeah, listen, sure. Mike will hit on you. Yeah, roll that thirsty. Yeah, I know. Where is it? Uh, here it is. Uh, Mike is thirsty. He's thirsty, thirsty for anybody. Uh, so, Mom, what thirsty means? I'm right. All right. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, so I sent her an email letting her know that uh, my college girlfriend and I, who I was living with in an apartment, uh, decided in December that we were going to split, that we were going to we were going to break up. Um, however, we had an entire other semester of school and an apartment lease, so in college thinking we're like okay let's just still live together and Mm. sort of be together but not be together and be heartbroken and not and just make it work living together sleeping in the same bed for six months after you've decided to break up Mm. it was a wow that was a that was a thing that we did and uh we all survived it and so was that like a I'm hoping we still get back together. So but like I'll agree to break up, but we're living like or no, were you both were pretty done. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I should let her speak for herself of what her Fair. perspective was, but she would very much not want to speak anything to do with this wisely. Uh, but I I my memory of it was it was sort of my decision because I was good. I was graduating a year earlier than her. And I was like, I can. You know, we're sort of at the path now. We've been together for long enough, almost three years at that point. Like, you sort of have to, like, should I get decide, off the pot? should I get off the pot? And I was like, yeah, I don't think that's going to be my thing uh, long term. And I was sort of stuck in the, the terrible situation because, like, I want to be fair to her in all of the various permutations of that. Because, like, is it worse to tell her that I'm going to break up with you later and now we have to be together in this weird, awkward time? Or is it worse to know in the back of my head that I'm going to do it and and make her think that, oh yeah, you know what? We're still on a path to move forward like that. And I, and, you know, I, I actually wrote a song about this called Nice is Easier Than Fair. Mm-hmm. And I thought the nice thing to do would have been like, oh, let's keep it together. But the fair thing to do is to be upfront. I should maybe, maybe I'll play a clip from that at some point. Okay. Um, but it was a it was a good tune. Anyway, so that's what was going on there. So it was an awkward time. And um uh, weren't was, they all? Yeah, it was it was weird. And and we basically sort of stayed together until I graduated. So it but we both knew it was ending, which, you know, today, I think that would be a little little easier, you know, when you're both like adults and like, okay, this is what the deal is. We'll keep it at this in this sort of lane. But when you're, you know, 20, 21 years old, that's a much more difficult thing to do. Yeah, it works great in television because when you know it's the last season, you can write for the finale. But uh, in real life, it it is a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, what was happening there. All right, let us talk about... Click, come on, get there, here we go. It's time for the Out of Practice Podcasts This Day in the World. The greatest hits, the biggest movies, headlines from Vermont, essential sports updates, and for some inexplicable reason, the weather from 20 years ago. Now back to Keith and Mike. Well, folks, again, we are talking about December 9th, the year 2001. We, of course, were listening to You Got It Bad, performed by Usher, the local... Oh, look at that. We've got like a tweet. Nice. The uh, local Burley Free Press talked about U.S. Marines' search for terrorists. Uh, I couldn't see the article, but I'm assuming that has to do with uh, in Afghanistan as we were... I don't, I don't know at this point whether we had gotten control over the whole country at that point. <laughs> we never did. But in terms of like the actual main offensive might have been over by then. Uh, so that was what's happening. The top movie. Uh, we've got like a run of classics all in a row. So the top movie was Ocean's Eleven. 
Mm. The first of the Ocean's Eleven series, which took in $38 million. And you think it is time for us to move to the best segment. But no, we are going to do... Back in time. True crime. You know, interestingly, Keith... I uh I didn't do the camera thing right. No, but I've got the little I've got the I'm really thinking about it hard. Let me see if I can't uh No, I think it looks good. All right. Well, you work to solve that. I, I, th- I, I think I'm good. Like I I I'm good in color. I'm better in color. Okay. I, I thought I could do it, but I, I guess I can't do it. What? And though it looks like it looks right there. Why can't I Interestingly. Got, oh, I, I know Keith. I know what it is. Uh-huh. I think this is, is fascinating to listen to, especially for the 98% of you who listen. Oh, you know why? Because you're really watch. tiny. You're really tiny. I'm going to hold on, folks. Get ready for this. Keep this ready for the is magic. The hot content. Well, while you're doing that, I will thank our good friend and founding sponsor, I am Jorge Novoa, for submitting this and sending it to me and not to Mike because uh, apparently Mike's going to listen hard and. Uh, Figure out what's going on. Now, there we go. We're ready now. You're, okay, you're black we're ready. And white. Okay. <clears throat> Shortly after midnight on December 9th, the year 2001, a 48 year old business executive went back inside her Forest Hills home after having a few glasses of wine by the pool. At some point, her husband, too, went back inside. And at quarter to 3 a.m., the husband, a fiction writer, called 911 to report that his wife was still breathing. That is, she was in an accident, but still breathing. She fell down the stairs, but breathing. Unconscious, sure, but most definitely still breathing. And though during the call, the writer never says a word to his wife trying to wake her up, he absolutely must hang up on the operator so he can continue to say nothing to his wife, who is almost definitely not dead yet. And despite the fact that the operator could have offered help to save his living, breathing wife, the husband was so distressed that, whoops, he forgot to mention to the dispatcher there was blood everywhere. But what happened to Kathleen? Was she pushed down the stairs? Was she beaten with a blow poke? Was she attacked by an owl? And just what was Michael Peterson doing hanging out by the pool when it was 55 degrees outside in Forest Hills, Durham, North Carolina? Fun fact, that very pool in that very house was featured in The Handmaid's Tale, the 1990 movie, which featured David Dukes as an uncredited doctor. Yes, the very same, not that David Dukes, David Dukes featured in episode 312 of The Practice as Mike's favorite client, the father who dropped his dead grandbaby at a random church. There it is, folks. Yeah, that's the staircase one. The staircase, yeah. Yeah. That was now? That's uh, who interestingly... I, if I remember correctly, looks like the actor David Dukes. Well, the, yes, the guy from that documentary. Through and through, folks. Synchronicity. That's, well, that's just cool. say it confidently. Synchronicity. It's a word. It is now. It is now. Itch. So uh, yeah, fascinating. And wow, so the- that so they filmed the Hands Handma- Handmaid's Tale 1990 movie in that same pool. Which would have been before the murder happened. Which isn't, yeah, they use, I mean, like, yeah, if you're rich and you have a big estate, with like, you get location scouted. I, I, I get it. Yeah, 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 for sure. Of course, uh, he, he, I'm glad that he pointed out that this is Forest Hills in Durham, not Forest Hills in Queens. I'm like, I would have, like, I almost bought a house in Forest Hills in Queens. Like, what the heck? Like, uh, I would have remembered that from the documentary, but that's. Not what happened. Thank you, Jorge. Let us move forward, finally. And I know everybody's waiting, Phoenix. I know Thank you're God. waiting. Thank God. For everyone's favorite segment. 
It's time, it's, time, it's, time. It's, time. it's time for Sports Bowl. The New York Football Giants lost a disappointing matchup to the Quincy Carter-led Cowboys. Dickie Barber ran for 110 yards, but Kerry Collins was only able to muster 122 yards passing. Emmett Smith rushed for 62 yards and a touchdown. The game dropped the Giants to 5-7. and seven. Meanwhile, the Philadelphia Football Eagles surged to an 8-4 and four with a win over the San Diego Chargers. Doug Flutie Flakes Flutie. Through for 370 yards in the loss. Didn't time that one that well. No, I, I took it out early. <laughs> you took it? You can't take it out. I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. And I'm not going to take this anymore. It's time to talk about the damn episode. Oh. Okay, we are talking, of course, about the practice season six, episode nine, Inter Arma Silent Lieges. This was written by we are Jonathan talk about Shapiro. What that means, right? What's that? We're going to talk about what that means at some point because I, I I barely knew. I don't even know how to pronounce it, let alone what it means. Well, I I am going to tell you what it means, but it's a bit of a spoiler. Okay, so we wait. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wait. We'll do it at the end. If I remind me, if not, because I I do have the translation. Okay. Uh, this has a teleplay by Jonathan Shapiro, who last rate wrote Liars Poker, with a story by Lucas Reiter, who last wrote on Honor Code and Jonathan Shapiro, and it was directed by Andy Wolk, who last directed The Confession, which okay. leaves us with only one more thing to do before we watch. Hopefully, a better episode of the practice. Good God! What is that supposed to mean? What's your problem? Is this what happens to women when you insert your penis? <laughs> what? what? What does Mike think's gonna happen? Yeah, you know, what if he would have drank the curdled milk? Then what would have happened? Um. So. Uh, sexy pitches. Let's hear we're going, it. Going big, we're going sexy hot pitches off the presses. Here we're gonna go. Mission accomplished. This is gonna have to do with like a very military thing. Uh, a military guy is accused of murder of a a civilian, so that it, it's not going to like the military court. We're in real court, but we're defending a, 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 a veteran uh, for what's ostensibly a war crime, but it's not. And we have to use some sort of legalese to figure it out. Uh, and but 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 worry not, folks. Worry not. I was pretty. This worried. is the episode. This is the <laughs> episode where Helen Gamble, biggity bangs. With D.A. Low, Finally. So remember when we said this was the season of big pitches? This is clearly now just the season of Mike waiting for Helen to bang somebody. <laughs> well, uh, if, you, if the, the consolation prize <laughs> to my loving mother will be <laughs> Helen Gamble <laughs> with Office Space. Okay, well, <laughs> if you would like to listen to us, listen to that episode, hop over to your podcasting service of choice, and we will see you back here on YouTube for the Oopsies. And we are b -b back, baby! Yes, indeed, we have just watched the practice season nine episode, season six, episode nine, Inter Arma, Silent Lieges. We now know what it means, but Mike is going to summarize it all for us twice. First up with, wait, wait, I got to find it. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> Why can't I find it? I do this every week. Oh, here we go. 30 seconds to remember what just happened on the show. America's pissed, baby, because, you know, 9-11 and stuff. And so there's a client that Rebecca has, but she can't meet him because national security. And she's like, what's going on? And like, and then he's like, no, it's cool because I, I'm an American and I don't want them to think anything. And so like, yeah, that's about it. 
And then Eugene is playing the race card, and it seems like he still actually has a pretty good case because it seems like there is some racism involved. But then the jury's like, nah, fuck that. You guys are fighting too much. Yes. Well, fair enough. And uh, could you do the same thing, but just in fewer syllables? Mm, sure. Eugene race card plea. National security. Mission accomplished? Hmm. Hmm. Mm. Very profound. Very profound, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, you want to know what else is profound? It's a segment. Ladies and gentlemen. The we Out of Practice this. Podcast, in unofficial, unsolicited, unfactual association with David E. Kelly Productions, proudly present... Oopsie! The Oopsies! Celebrating excellence in acting good, lawyering good, guesting good, and being Tom Brady. Not to mention, this is where we rate the episode and stuff. Now... Here are your hosts, Keith and Mike. What the hell are the oopsies? Well, Jackie, they're an award show that begins every week with... Most Valuable! Keith, something tells me the oopsies this week are going to be challenging? Hmm... <laughs> Would you like me to go first, Michael? Yes. Okay. Uh, most valuable lawyer. I I don't think I don't think you can give it. Well, you, I, I, there's an argument for Eugene because they pretty His much client's not going to prison the, currently. The client is not going to prison, and it seemed like at the outset that he was very definitely going to go to prison for murder, and he at least is temporarily not doing that. But my argument is for Rebecca. And she had an impossible task. Uh, she was going up against the federal government who would not, who would barely even acknowledge that they had her client. And at great personal risk, I mean, to be a part of this, like the government investigates you just for being a lawyer for a client in this situation. Well, she was not able to resolve it in a satisfactory way. Like she was able to help the person get out or at least get a trial. Because, you know, what's what was happening then and it's still happening, you know, some of these people they just picked up, they still don't have a trial. They're still just in prison. They, it's it's in, The lack of due process is astounding. But at the very least, she was able to give his wife some more information. His wife, at the end of it, at least knew what the fuck was happening. And there's a lot that was not able to be uncovered. I thought she, you know, the question about torture was uh, a, an, an un, unopened, unanswerable question at that point. But she did at least give the wife some idea what's going on, which has to be better than just my husband was randomly disappeared and I'll never know what happened. Yes. Um, I definitely agree. It's a shame we don't have most unlikely lawyer because the the jury firm foreman sure got a closing statement didn't he he sure did yeah but i think that you are you are right i think it's rebecca for all the reasons you stated and because i can't make a strong enough case for anyone else okay congratulations rebecca on your on your wholehearted case and a lack of effort from mike <laughs> that's fair lack of strong case uh for your m v l it's now time for uh, stretch. I didn't stretch last week, and I think my back is still out. Already famous because you've been on TV. Getting a pay Watch check. The first entry on your IMDb. Stop. Stop. I know. Stop. 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 What the hell? Well, you got it. you're lagging a little bit, Keith, and it, and it made me upset. So <laughs> I was like, trying to fix it, even though that was probably um, unnecessary. You know what I mean? Oh. 
you know, it's, it's sometimes it's not just not going to happen the way we want it to. Just because I lag doesn't mean I don't love. Well, I'm going to try to fix it anyway because now you're frozen. No, I think we're going to be okay. It's going to be okay, I Mike. I promise. All right. Should we try again? Even if my little frozen. Okay. Uh-huh. Take two. Already famous because you've been on TV Getting a paycheck the first entry on your IMDb Way to go But you're the best guest actor You are the best guest actor You are the best guest actor on the episode Um, you know, I think that uh, Mr. Habib was really good And also his mm-hmm. wife uh, I thought were both very compelling. I thought Jerry Foreman made a strong case at the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, James but, McDonald. James McDonald. But I, I, I do think that. Also, how do we do? How is the new? How is the new district attorney? Is he? What do we? Bill Simitrovich is yeah. would be a guest actor. Okay, he was excellent, but he didn't really do as much. Uh, so I think I'm going to go with the wife, who was played by. The wife was played by Jessica Steen. Which, getting an oopsie on her reappearance on the episode is pretty spectacular. I don't know if that's happened before. So. And, folks, I, I'm I'm just going to say quickly, for the sake of quickness, uh, I completely agree. I thought she was tremendous in the episode uh, and deserves the oopsie. But I think it's important. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the very first unprecedented double oopsie winner for playing two separate characters. Can you believe this? Jessica Steen played the sister in season four, episode six, Marooned, and now has won a second oopsie. As a returner playing Dr. Sarah Ford. That's a, that's a big doings. Yeah, that's really incredible. That's really incredible. Yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty excited. Like that's a we have here we are in uh season six, have something unprecedented happen. So um uh, there it is. Big, big doings. What's next in the big doing category? Uh this doing. You killed your podiatrist or blew Oops. the case. That's wrong. But you let a single tear run down your face. I did your you're tear because you're, you're distracted. Actor on the show. It's all falling apart. That's not what I want. That's not what I want. This is what I want. Give it to me. <laughs> Mike is fighting tech, and I can see the depression behind his <laughs> eyes. Um, Don't let the tech destroy you. You know, <sighs> Lara Flynn Boyle and Steve Harris are great in this episode, but I really yeah. think Rebecca is the is the best actor. I really think, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Lisa Hamilton. I really think she had a much more intricate, nuanced uh, arc. I don't, not even an arc. Uh, intentions to play because. She was she was going into uncharted waters, and so there was sort of like while she had to be uh, stern and fight for her client, there was a there was a, a befuddlement and an inquisitiveness and a sort of a fish out of waterness to her performance because this is un, uncharted waters, especially at the time, and that's something uh, you have to really make some bold choices as an actress to to start to cover ground that is. Uh, very, very fresh and and very hot topic issues. So uh, I'm gonna go with Lisa Hamilton. Yeah, um, yeah, I I agree. Um, I thought I thought Steve Harris was great in this episode. Um, he always is. Uh, but I I do I think it's Lisa Gay. I think she she has has always been and continues to be the moral authority of the show. And um, I thought her. This arc for her, it really made sense that this was her arc, that that this this really matches the character well. Um, and it's you know it, it's a little bit more about the writing than about her performance. But I thought her her final paragraph then comparing um, what was happening after 9-11 to the Japanese internment, 
after and during World War II, I thought was really important, both for this episode, but also in general, to be to have that be put out into the ether already that soon after 9-11, I thought was very, very important. So uh, I agree. Congratulations, Lisa Gay Hamilton, on your best actor. Oopsie. Which brings us to... The Tom Brady Award for being Tom Brady. Uh, last week was great. Uh, you're not going to see it, but uh, go to our Instagram at Out of Practice Podcast. Out of Practice Podcast. I don't remember what it was, but I will have done it by the time this airs. I think it, was, it had something to do with another baby. I think we made Tom Brady a baby again. I think so. Maybe? Yeah, I think yeah. it was. Uh... Uh, this week, let's. Uh... Oh, man. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you have danger Will Robinson on both cases. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know what? Hmm. Because I want to throw this to Keith, I'm going right, to keep it thanks. vague and say this week it's Patriot Brady. Patriot Brady. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because Which is the, ironic. Uh, Mr. Mr. Habib was a, a proud American, and I'm sure mm -hmm. Mr. Brady is too. So let's see how Keith pulls that off. And, you know, to be fair, Brady did spend 21 years as a patriot. I know I'm giving so. you an out. I'm going to see how <laughs> Keith editorializes this one. Mm, okay. Interesting. Patriot Brady, congratulations for your Tom Brady award for being Tom Brady. All right. Let's get to it. Let's get in it. Ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to stay on the two shot here because this is a conversation we need to have because there's a lot to unpack here. I'm going to start with case. So as a whole, I really was compelled. As I mentioned halfway through, I thought it was deftly handled uh, by the writing, the directing, the performances. Nothing was, you know, a lot of times they run the risk of, as I've said many times, over editorializing. And I didn't feel like that was happening at first. Um, especially in the A case, uh, well, uh, let's call it the B case, I guess, the Mr. Habib case, the federal, the mission accomplished case, if you will. Because as we mentioned, it's, it's very, it was, it's very, uh, current at the time, right? And, and looking back, it's like a perfect time capsule of sort of the varying sentiments of the country, of the legal system at the time. There was a lot of obfuscation. Uh, there was a lot of confusion, a lot of secrecy, a lot of telling people they have rights, but in reality, denying them of their rights and how a do we handle that? A lot of just it? flat out racism. Yeah, that too. Um, so I, and, and I think that it's, it's presented you know, though artistically and with some license, very reality-based at the moment. And the questions that are raised are all questions we were dealing with. And I thought that the way it's presented and the way it's not ended, just kind of, it's just a lot of questions presented and points made. And I think that's kind of where we were. And I think it's fair. And I, I, and I enjoyed, well, I don't want to say enjoyed. I appreciated that we didn't, give it some sort of ending that wasn't earned or that would, would not have rang true. Um, because as it turns out, many of those questions and issues remain. Yeah. So I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the performance of, of Mr. Habib, uh, because and the wife, that whole interplay, Ramsey because, yep. because it, it was, it felt authentic and it's felt strained and it was tortured. And, that's it, right? I mean, we don't know for sure that this guy didn't, I mean, and I actually like that they left the question mark as to what is his role in all of this? And that's and that's kind of a point that is made, I think, purposefully, is that by denying all of this uh, uh, information and denying any sort of interaction between the lawyer and him, we are left with just the possibility of nefarious action. The question of maybe he did do something. But that is sort of manufactured because he's not accused of anything. 
right? Right. It's right. just innuendo and and uh, scary maybes, which isn't at all what this shit's supposed to be based on, which I think is obviously the point and is scary, right? Yeah. Uh, so mission accomplished as far as what it's trying to present. I think the episode presents it uh, yeah. effectively. Yeah. So, well, and and I I'll I'll chip in my thoughts on this half, and then we'll yes. talk about the other half. Um, yeah. No, I I agree with you. I I I really like that they told this story. I like that they told the story from this point of view. I like the characters they chose for this. Uh, I think they, you know, it, it is as I've said many times before, the type of episode that I react to the most, pointing out an injustice, pointing out a flaw in the system, pointing out giving us something to think about about how our system is not working for us and and I think um the timeliness of it was was very uh is not lost on me and the fact that um again they had to film this in November of 2001 and probably write it in October I mean this this happened very quickly and I thought explored it in a very um in 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 an in an honest and truthful way, in a way that has stood up to the test of time, like this situation was, you know, they were right. This is exactly what was happening, and worse, and um, and and it was an injustice then, and it was an injustice now, and we all know that it was an injustice now, but it was still controversial then whether or not that was an injustice, and it it planted its flag, and I think so on the right side of history. So I I very much. Appreciated that part of it. So uh, I, those are my thoughts on on that. What, what what did you what did you take <laughs> from the A case here? Uh, well, before we jump to the A case, I, I I I do question. I'm curious as to whether there was a conversation in the writers' room, and and what changes as far as impact and how it was received at the time and now. Had this been the exact same episode, except or exact same case or half of the episode. But his his family and wife were also of Arab descent, Arab Americans, mm. right? Like, do we let ourselves off the hook? Are we making is the point strengthened by the fact that she, she, uh, she was uh, she's I mean, white, a, yeah, yeah, she's a white lady, uh, or is that just a way to like ease the view, the audience into the uh, well? Okay, he must be a good guy because it's you know he. Like I, I'm curious if that's clearly that's an a con- interesting point. Yeah, it's clearly I, a conscious I, I, choice. But what what was the what what's the impetus of it? Yeah. Well, I I I, I wonder if there is something there that does not speak highly of what the show thought of its audience's capacity for empathy. Um. By like, let us let's walk you in here. Let's spoon feed you a little bit into this and uh i i wonder i wonder and if if using using the white lady as the bait to pull you into this story uh yeah it's an interesting point i i I would be very curious to be a fly on the wall of that writer's room and and i wonder if it would be necessary to do that today Mm mm-hmm you know, the, Re- Rebecca's righteousness, you know, would that have been just as pure? Would that would she have been more apt? To, I'd like to believe that it wouldn't have affected her, but it's curious. It's a curious, there's no think, answer. I don't think it would have affected Rebecca's, but right. maybe Joe, average Joe American. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's also interesting it's that they chose to, you think that Jimmy is going to have more of a a, a part in the narrative there because it seems like, oh, this is a very Jimmy play this sort of conservative viewpoint, but they, they, they backed away from it because I don't think he was really necessary. Um, no, well, and, they, and it's interesting that they gave the final summation of the, well, we're scared to Lindsay, which yeah. I, which I guess would not be Jimmy's perspective. That would be because Jimmy's perspective would be like, would be more like America justification, keep us safe. Mm-hmm. And Lindsay's, bringing in the fact that we're all scared, which we were. And, you know, that the message there, of course, is that like, yeah, of course we're all scared and that is understandable and, un, and, and, and uh, we're all feeling it. And of course, but our legal system is specifically designed to not 
take your emotions into the law. The law is the law and our emotions are emotions, both of which are important and should be valued, but they should not be, one should not be influencing the other. Okay, so moving on to the A case. Yeah. So what, you know, up until like the final moments, I actually, what I what I thought, what I, they, they took a, a practice trope and they turned it on its head because generally speaking, the, uh, we presume our, our client as innocent and it, it turns, but but there's a good case against him and it turns out that Eugene's able to sort of like use some race card issues or, po or point out race issues to get our client off, right? Because he's, he's I don't wanna say cutthroat, but he's really, he's a skilled litigator and he's impassioned with those issues and whatnot. This time they flip it on its head a bit, at least in my viewing, this first viewing of it, that it seems like he's making an assumption of guilt of his client and he doesn't want to mm -hmm. be there and he doesn't want to make the race card. He's either evolved or it feels a little gross to him or it feels out of place. And, and so he's forced into it. And then in, in being as good as he is, he actually presents a really, what I think is a really solid case. Like nothing he says seems forced. None of the witnesses he call he, he makes it a, a, a cogent case for, some racial bias and at least some reasonable doubt, right? We can talk, well, we're going to talk about whether we think there was enough reasonable doubt or whatnot. Now, the, and we've seen it before in the crack. This is, this is not, there's nothing egregious about this particular case other than the, like, they try to make the claim, well, this guy was like, he wasn't just a black guy. He was like a homeless black guy, like a stinky homeless guy. Right. Here's look at this mugshot. He looks like a thug and a stinky homeless person. Like so, it's clear. Like so, that felt gross a little bit. But it, and the only added difference, but you see this before, is that there's a there's a lot more sort of like personal sniping between the the, the lawyers and and objections. And Kittleson had to step in a bunch of times. And like maybe that's what the jury. But you know, just as I'm giving all this credit about really playing it down the middle in the in the other case here. The jury thing, like you said, betwixt the two of us, we can't even really make up a, a solid argument for what the hell that's even supposed to mean. Yeah, like, and that, that's it felt what a little I was bit like with. racism. Racism has not is not a part of this conversation. It's always a part of the conversation to this uh, very day. So what what is the what is the righteousness on their part? Uh, yeah, and I I didn't get it. Like honestly, like I. I, I was sort of like, oh, this is an interesting case up until the the weird speech at the end by the jury, which was clearly what the writers were, were you know, it was so clear that they the writer's backwards. voice were coming directly from the jury. Mm -hmm. But I still don't understand the point they were trying to make, really, because like if if this if this case this episode is supposed to be sort of some condemnation of making race a part of this trial. They did a really bad job of showing it because I thought that what Eugene did was a good defense of his client. And, you know, yes, I, I think we are led to believe that the client is probably guilty. Uh, but if he's not, Right. Let's say that the client's story is true, that they actually were having a consensual relationship and the murder happened coincidentally with their having that relationship. Well, if if that's true, then Eugene has proven very clearly that race would have played a part in that. And that's and it's it is not, you know, it, I whether or not I believe it is more or less likely, it is part of a coherent story. Like the the story that he told of them having this sort of secret relationship and whatever, like, I don't know how necessarily likely it is, but it's not impossible. And it is a, a fully thought out coherent story. Well, we've so, seen we've seen way more implausible defense defenses and and uh accusations on the show and so it's not even like they absolutely you know what I, mean? I mean plan being the butler or whatever all of these situations where i think the behavior of the lawyers were far more egregious than this and uh 
you know, and I think setting aside what the jury said at the end, this was really a case about Helen being bad at her job. And I'll tell you why. Because yeah. Helen allowed this case to become about everything other than the actual evidence, which was murder, his fingerprints on the murder weapon, nobody else there. It's his, like, they can prove that he was there. They can prove he had access and he touched the murder weapon. And there was nobody else that they were able to come up with that could have possibly done it. That's her case. If she's a, if she's doing her job, whatever they're throwing out about this other stuff, she just dismisses it and goes back to, what does that have to do with his fingerprints on the murder weapon? What does that have to do with he was the only one with opportunity? And, and, and so, so the witness was racist. Okay, so fine. So who's the other guy? Who, who, well, so who did she see? It's not just Helen fumbling, right? It's, it's also the jury being completely irresponsible because the jury has every capability to come back and ask those questions. Hey, we want to we want to hear the testimony about the can we see the transcript of the testimony about the forensic evidence? X Y Z. But instead they're like, "You know what? This we're gross. This was gross. We're out." What? Yeah, and, and, and you're even, willing to go to prison for it? And I don't know what's so gross about it. Like right. everything that Eugene did was justifiable. That's They're, another writing room thing. Like, if we're gonna work backwards, like we want to make this statement about race in our in our in our judicial discourse, you work backwards, and you better create a fucking like a case that is so lopsided and has nothing to do with race, and then they make it about race. But this was uh, then they made it a case about race. Well, and it was per well, and and like, it it makes me wonder, like, is is this about? white people's discomfort with having to factor in that race is a much bigger factor in a lot more things than they're comfortable thinking about. Like, is, yeah, yeah. is, is this like, like, uh, uh, cause like if people like, like, Oh, playing the race card, playing the race card. It's so terrible. It's so bad. Well, it's probably just, if, if you're, if you're even using the word race card over and over again, yeah, I think it's probably just speaks to your discomfort with having to acknowledge your privilege or acknowledge the fact that race plays a bigger role in our society than you'd like to think it is. Like, you know, it's it's the whole idea of like, I'm colorblind. I don't see race. Well, that that idea is now so backwards. And so and so like the 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 weird, awkward justification of somebody who benefits from from racial disparities or injustice in some fashion. So that it like, if that's what this is real, if that is really the point of view of the writer's room, if that's, if that's really what's happening here, like, Oh, you like you, you messed up this thing by making me uncomfortable about race. And I don't like that. There's such a divergence from case one and case two in terms of the sort of uh, awareness, social awareness of the writing room. And it's so, it, it's it, it it's confusing. And I think that's why I, 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 I after I watched this and, and noted it, I was like, I'm confused by the point of view of this episode. Right, because the ending, uh, I like, like we said, the ending of that, of the, of the, B case is very it, the the uh, open ended ending of the first case, uh, second case. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> it serves it serves the the greater point, right? It serves the sort of thesis or right. the sentiment, right? Whereas the second case, it feels like well, okay, if we're we're just gonna have open endings here, it, that doesn't serve any point like it doesn't strengthen any point from the case right it's well, just it, seems a cop out well it's but I, you know like the show's point of view means that whether he did it or not is a little bit irrelevant what it's about is condemning eugene's strategy and helen's participation in it but i you know again like why <laughs> like that's his job Right, and from the jury's perspective, if if you're coming from a place of 
you know, she, she, she pressed them on it. Like, well, this should be about the victim and it's not. Well, by you not make, by you making a, re, not rendering a verdict, you are either sending a murderer back on the street or you are allowing a innocent man to re stand trial with different people. Like you're abdicating your responsibility because you're pissed at the lawyers. It, it's still, it just doesn't make any fucking sense. Well, well also if, if we take race out of it, and right. we're talking about a courtroom, by the way, where Kittleson has shown the penises before, where she's all kinds of crazy stuff. And none of, of those, yeah. yeah, none of those jurors have ever been like, this has been a farce. We're out. No. If you take race out of it, right, and you say, all right, so it's this is about the defense putting up a whole big smokescreen, confusing nonsense uh, to... That's every episode of the to, practice. To just, just make a mess out of, you know, and and make everything ambiguous, right? Okay. So, yeah, all right. I get that's a, a strategy that it, sort of a desperate defense might make. But then the prosecution's job is to get us back on track, focus on what is relevant, focus on what is important. And we know Helen's a good lawyer, right? She's good at that. So if she can't, if she can't, get us back on topic and filter through the nonsense, maybe it's not nonsense. Mm. Mm. So I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm confused about the point of view of the show here. I really am. So, it's, so we it's have hard to, to render. Adjudicate. We can't do what the jury did. We have to render our verdict. We do. I refuse to say how many tires. <laughs> Although that would be pretty funny. That would be a pretty funny way to end this is to just not, deliver the tires it almost feels like we have to do that doesn't we it? might have to okay All folks right. well, we refuse we refuse to give this episode a number of tires though let me say in in earnest which is very rare mm, mm. if if you got it or you think you got it and have a, a, a maybe a, you want to pitch to us what you think this was about and i'm sure there are some of you who might have an opinion let us know You're because smarter than us. Yeah, we are a little lost because uh, you know that that is. But Keith, let's do something we can do. Mm, let's what's talk that? about. Uh, we we know the Easter egg here for Dad. Uh, this is clearly mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. <laughs> mission accomplished. Uh, which we got was the terrorists. America. Yeah. Let's talk about a person who did not feel any sort of. Uh, ambiguity feelings, yeah i was pretty certain about uh, their story <sighs> their their verdict uh, uh regardless of the evidence nonsense words confidently <laughs> strategy <laughs> if you want to talk about look whatever your feelings are if i think we can all agree that that like aircraft carrier party thing was the fucking stupidest <laughs> it's fucking stupidest thing it, well, oh, it so perfectly encapsulated the idiocy of that the but of course like under W's like charming idiocy was the incredible darkness and horror that was happening behind the scenes. So whew, what a mess. What a mess. And it's just starting here on the practice. We have a couple more seasons where we're gonna be right in the mess of it. But if you would like to talk about our mess, talk about all the stupid stuff we've talked about today, you can join the conversation by emailing outofpracticepodcast at gmail.com, finding us on Facebook and Instagram at Out of Practice Podcast. And while you're at it, don't be like us. Render a verdict on the Out of Practice Podcast by leaving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other service of your choice. Kittleson is right there, and she's going to put you in contempt if you do not render a verdict. You know who has rendered a verdict, for better or worse for them, but they are our founding sponsors. They have donated to the Out of Practice Podcast, and they are Jorge Novoa, Cloud Lover 69, Leanne Wrights, Jennifer Masanova, and Kari Kuhn. You can join them by giving us your money once a month <laughs> or just one time. Hmm. You can do so by clicking either of the links that I leave in the show notes. Hey, do you want to help us out a different way? Follow us on the YouTube and find our other show about Star Trek toys and get ready because there's other stuff in the works. If you thought we couldn't get nerdier, you were wrong. At the end of the day, you only have one duty. You don't have to render any sort of judgment. 
All you gotta do is reach down deep and fire off those laser sounds. Laser sounds. <laughs>